Well, today we're going to be in 2 Peter 3, uh, verses 1 through 9, and the title of the message is a second reminder, and we see why as we read the first verse. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the word of that time was deluged, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And you might notice in, in your uh, bulletin, uh, Pat put the outline of the message in there today, and I'd uh, put it on Facebook earlier, uh, day or, uh, yesterday I think maybe I put it on there. But uh, uh, the first thing I want us to look at is, is the word uh, stimulate. The, it speaks about arousing and stirring up, and, and, and that's our first point in the message is that we need to stimulate our minds. Uh, he said, uh, I, I, it, I've written to you as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. And it means to arouse, to stir up. It's the idea that, you know, that I get in my mind that being at a campfire and trying to get a fire going again so you, you, you begin to fan the ambers or the ashes or the coals and th throw a little bit of dry grass in there and you start getting a flame again as you, as you blow on it, as you fan it, and you arouse it and stir it up. And sometimes we need that in our lives because we've come, become somewhat complacent that we need to be aroused and our, and our thinking needs to be stimulated into what? Wholesome thinking. So to me, it, it's, it must be pretty easy for us to allow our minds to drift into areas that it shouldn't be. And I think Peter is making a contrast here between the unwholesome thoughts and tactics of the false teachers and the way that we as God's children are to think and are to live. Paul wrote about this actually in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So Paul was saying basically the same thing Peter is saying here is our minds need to be stimulated to wholesome thoughts and to wholesome living because if we, if we follow the false teaching of those prophets as we saw last year, they'll lead us into all sorts of sensuality and to problems. You know, uh, Jesus said in, in Matthew's gospel that the heart is filled with, you know, with lust and greed and evil and and lying and, and, uh, and all sorts of things like that. So we need to bring it under control of the spirit so we'll be stimulated to wholesome thinking. The second thing that Peter says we need to do in verse 2 is to activate the memory. I want you to recall, so I want you to activate the memory, saying the word spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through, uh, through your apostles. So he's saying, I want you to remember what the prophet said in the Old Testament. I want you to remember what Moses wrote about so that you can learn from them and remember the commands given by our Lord and Savior and the apostles. Now, Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 and 2 actually speak to this. Uh, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, same thing Peter is saying here, uh, in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So we need to activate our memory by recalling, by remembering, and reactivating the power of those words that were spoken in the Old Testament and what Jesus said. And when we do that, 
will be following him, will be walking in step with him instead of being laid astray, uh, led astray. You know, I, uh, just to give you an example, you know, you got a lot of people out there teaching silly things. Uh, I had a friend uh, down in uh, 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 the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he said one Sunday morning a fellow showed up at the church and said, God told me to speak here. And my friend said, well, that's funny. I was just talking to him in prayer, and he didn't say anything to me about it. You know, and, and so we've got people who will come along and give us a false message a lot of times and saying God said this and God said that. I want you to know God will never say anything that is contrary or will contradict the Bible. It, he won't do it. This is his word. It was given to us freely, free of error, and, and he, the Holy Spirit will never lead us to do anything that contradicts the teaching of God's word. The, something else we need to do, and that's in verse 3, we need to calibrate our comprehension. Above all, you must understand, and that's it, that we're calibrating our thinking to God's word and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Above all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come. Not that they might come, but they will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. Now, scoffers mock, they denigrate, and they ridicule the message and the messengers of God's word. They think you're crazy if you believe in end-time prophecies, and they laugh at the idea of a future judgment. The last days, folks, actually began with the first advent of Jesus when he was born in that lowly manger. He lived a sinless life. He died the death of the cross. He rose again on the third day, and there's a promise that he gave us that he's going to come again. And the closer we get to the second time of Christ's return, the, the second coming of Christ, uh, the louder the sneering and the snickering will grow. Uh, you know, we are mocked more today than at any time in my lifetime. And more and more, the thinking of the world's bec becoming more secular than it is holy. And that we have a, a lack of knowledge among young people about what the Bible teaches. And, and, and the influence that the Bible has in their life is growing weaker and weaker. And, folks, that's really a sign of the times. People who deny, who deny the second coming of Christ are also denying the concept of a judgment. Because eventually there is going to be an ultimate judgment on those who have rejected Christ, and these people reject a life of holiness. In Hebrews 9, verses 27 and 28, it says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, to me, that's a very solemn verse. It's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. There is going to be an accounting day. There is going to be a time when the old chickens come home to roost and you have to answer what, for what you've done in your life. And then Peter said we also need to concentrate our hearing. Notice in verse 4. They will say, and let me say, you need to listen to what people are saying and interpret it in the light of the Bible and not the evening news. Uh, and not what is being said on Facebook or Twitter or some other social media, the filter that we need to, to, to judge what is being said is God's word. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So, you know, we need to wake up to the fact that there are mischievous imps who will in, insinuate that God's promises are invalid. And I think that's what happened to old Demas that Paul spoke about. So he said he's loved me more than the present world to come. And I think Demas was led astray uh, by listening to the wrong voices and by concentrating his hearing on the wrong message. But I want you to know that God keeps his promises. Just because he doesn't keep them on my timetable, I know he keeps them on his timetable. One of the first promises that Jesus gave about his coming again is actually John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be, tr uh, be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again. There it is. That's the promise that Jesus made about coming again. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Well, something else Peter said that we need to do is we need to integrate God's word. It's not enough just to carry it with you to church and take it home and set it down. You need to read it and make it a part of your life every day. Verses 5 through 7. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens came into being. They deliberately forget. And that's where we're at today with the skeptics and the scoffers. Uh, the message doesn't fit, <clears throat> doesn't fit their perception, so they act like they didn't know it. They want to lay it aside as though they can forget it. <clears throat> but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, <clears throat> and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time uh, was deluged and destroyed, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. You see, people don't like the repercussions of what God says, so they don't repent. Instead, they deliberately forget the lessons of history. And Peter gives us three lessons right here. Lesson number one, long ago by God's word, God spoke and it happened. God said, be light, and there was light. Be heaven, and there was a heaven. Be waters, and the waters were formed. Be a division among them, and that happened. But long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Lesson number two is verse six. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Lesson three, verse seven. By the same word, you know, Jesus Christ is the word of God, okay? And, and he can speak things into existence, and he can bring things to an end by speaking a word. By the same word, the present heavens and earth, the time in which we are living, are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, let me pause here to say this. These verses serve as evidence of Peter's belief in two supernatural events that are disputed today. They were disputed in his time period evidently because he spoke about it, but they're disputed today as well. The first is spatial creation by God. Now Exodus 20, 11 says, In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So he, he set an example. It didn't actually, God didn't need six days to, make, to, to create this. But he did it to set an example to you and me that we need to have a day of rest also and take time out to worship God. The second thing that Peter believed in is Noah's flood. It, it came when people were mocking God, when there were scoffers, they were not expecting it. But, uh, the, but Noah's flood came even though Noah had been preaching them the message they were still rejecting it, and the same will happen when Jesus returns. There will be mockers, there will be scoffers, they will be rejecting the message, but Jesus will come again, and, and, and it, what we're experiencing today is just a sign of the times. Listen as I read out of Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I made them, and then one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Peter affirms God's supernatural intervention in human history through creation and through the flood, and therefore we can believe uh, uh, what God says when he says he will intervene again at some time in the future when he returns, and eventually there'll be that fiery judgment. You know, there's an account of, of a universal flood in most ancient cultures, yet people still reject it because it was a supernatural event. Let me give you just th three quick reasons why I believe in a supernatural God who can do supernatural things. And I believe that God exists. The first is the cosmological argument. 
It says, every effect must, must, have, must have an adequate cause. The universe is an effect, and reason demands that whatever caused the universe must be greater than the universe. And that cause is God, who himself is the first uncaused cause. Now, let me give it to you simply. My dad's name was Eddie Seymour. His dad's name was Harold Seymour. His dad's name was Bert Seymour. And then, and then we go on back until we get back to Coleman Seymour, who is way on back there, and then we can trace the Seymours on back to England. And actually, if you go back far enough, I, I think I'm the right heir to the throne of England because, uh, be, because Jane Seymour was married to the king, but uh, Prince Harry and those guys don't agree with me. <clears throat> but you get back so far, and we all get back so far. You see, my dad and my mother were, were, were my cause. Until you get back to the first cause, which as far back as you can go is Adam and Eve, and then they had to have an uncaused cause. And that's where God comes into the picture. The second thing is the teleological argument. The universe displays an obvious, purposeful, intricate, and fine-tuned design, and this perfect design argues for a designer, and that designer is God. You get that out of Psalm 19, 1 through 4. And, uh, and, and so, you know, if you went out into the parking lot today and there were a bunch of Rolex watches out there and you'd never even seen a watch before, you wouldn't think that that just self-generated itself. You would think somebody put it there. And because the design demands a designer. And when we look at the grand scheme of the universe, this did not just happen. It took a designer. Let me give you, let me give you this example. If I went in here and we had a, a paper shredder and I shredded my Bible, every page of it, and then I brought that, that uh, uh, pail, that bucket that had all the pieces of the shredded paper in it, and I threw it up in the air here and we've got the fans on in the sanctuary, how many of you believe that that would fall back down with Genesis 1-1 as the very first verse and the last verse of Genesis at the very end and everything else in, in order? Anybody believe that would happen? The design of the universe, it's a greater miracle than that happening. I mean, you, the, the earth has to be on just the right axis or we would be too hot or we would be too cold. There'd be too much daylight or not enough, and it would destroy itself. There would be too much pressure, not enough pressure, too much oxy oxygen or not enough. God had to hang it in the atmosphere, in the universe, in just a specific way so that it would exist and, and uh, be able to support life. And thirdly, the moral argument. Every human being has an innate sense of oughtness or moral obligation. So where did this come from? I had a student uh, in, in, in the final paper they wrote this semester uh, in comparative religions. I teach at the college. She was going through and telling the story of her life and how, how, how she had not been treated right. The concept of not being treated right demands a moral standard of rightness. So what I'm saying is, if you believe that there is a moral standard, there must be a moral lawgiver, and that moral lawgiver is God. And these are just very quickly, I mean, the existence of a moral heart or moral law in our heart de it demands the existence of a moral lawgiver. And you get that out of Romans 1, verses 19 through 32. Well, something else Peter said is, we need to stipulate the promise. We need to believe the promises of God and apply them to our life. Verses 8 through 9. But do not forget this one thing. Now, Peter's been writing up to this point. He said, now, this is a second reminder today. And as I'm giving you this second reminder, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. He's writing to Christians. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, I'm going to take that last phrase first, 
And then we're going to go back to the first part of that verse. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, there are some people that say that part of this verse teaches universalism, which means everybody that's born is going to go to heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. And Peter indicates that he does not believe in the concept of universalism because according to him in chapter 2, verse 1, chapter uh, and verse 3, chapter 3, verses 6, 7, 9, and 16, he says anyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior will face eternal destruction. So that's not what that verse means. It simply means that it is God's desire for people to be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 through 6, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So God wants people to be saved, and so he provided the means of salvation in Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says, For neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God wants people to be saved, so he made the ultimate sacrifice in allowing his son Jesus to die the death of the cross with our sins. Now let's go back to the first part of that. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now God is eternal. Now what that means is God experience, experiences, et and you can't really explain eternity this way because eternal is eternal. But for our finite minds, God existed in eternity past, he exists in eternity present, and he will continue to exist in eternity future. But he sees it all as though it's happening right now. He's never baffled, he's never confused. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God is eternal, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he is all-present. So when we are struggling with an event that happens in our life and, we're, and it seems like it's taking years and years and years, it's right here and right now. And God is experiencing a thousand years as a day. And so tying this into what Peter is saying about remember this one thing, don't forget this one thing, the promise of Christ's return has been a promise that's been out there since God started it all. Did you realize that the promise of Christ's return is stipulated around 300 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament? And when you read the New Testament, it clearly teaches that Jesus will return. It teaches that his second coming will be physical and personal. Let me give it to you out of Acts 1. They gathered around Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And he goes ahead and tells them that there's to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight, and they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. This is his ascension. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now, on the return of Christ, it, it's, it, you've got what I call an R1 and an R2. The R1 is when Christ returns for the saints. That's what's called the rapture in the Bible. And R2 is at towards the end of the revelation when Christ returns with the saints or, or uh, the end of the tribulation period. When Christ returns with the saints and will, uh, and will end the great battle in the book of Revelation. Now the third thing that Peter is saying about this and the promise of his coming is his coming will be immediately preceded by worldwide distress. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know of anything that needs to happen prophetically before Jesus comes. Uh, you know, the way I read the Bible, I don't see any prophecy or anything that's keep, keeping Jesus from coming other than God's timetable. You know, God's got a plan, and I know he's got a plan, but I don't know all the details of that plan. But I am trying to live my life as though Jesus could come today. 
Now here's something else. Christ's return will bring upon the world judgment that is sudden, unexpected, and inescapable. What did Peter say? It, it's going to be destroyed by fire in the future. The rise of a powerful Antichrist figure will be conquered and overthrown, and then the millennial reign of Christ will occur, which will be a 1,000 period of peace and prosperity in the world. And the Old Testament speaks more about that than what the New Testament does. But as I said a moment ago, God has a plan. However, we do not know fully all the details of his plan. I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, the, 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 the disciples and apostles believed it was going to be in their day and hour. Uh, I've believed for many years it was going to happen, and I still believe it's going to happen because the Bible says so. And God has revealed some things about the future, but some of it is still a mystery. I read it, and I, uh, and I read it again, and each time I read it, I learn a little bit more about it. But we don't know the day or the hour, and beware of anybody who says they do. Because they're lying to you, they don't know. You know, I've got a timeline you know, on how I think the future will un unfold. I've got friends that have a bit of different timeline than mine. But the important thing is that we agree on the vital truths of Scripture. You can be wrong on the timeline and still go to heaven. You know, as long as you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that's the key thing. But the important thing is to agree on the, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit form the Trinity. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ, his death, resurrection, ascension, and his future return, whether it happens before the tribulation, halfway through the tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation. And I know that might be a whole lot more theology than you're used to hearing. But the fact is, he is coming again. You know, thousands of, pound, th thousands of people right now today have prayed part of the Lord's Prayer Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But there are thousands of those thousands of people who live their lives as though they don't believe Jesus is coming back, live their lives as though there will be no judgment. The, the old Apostles' Creed says, He will come to judge the living and the dead. And the, and the churches that recite that today, uh, even though they recite it in church, many of them do not believe in a future judgment or that Christ is coming again. Alexander McLaren, an old Scottish preacher, once said, the apostolic church thought more about the second coming of Jesus Christ than about death and heaven. The early Christians were not looking for a cleft in the ground called a grave, but a cleavage in the sky called glory when Jesus comes, to, comes again. Well, Father, I want to thank you for this time that we had together. I want to thank you, Lord, for these words of Peter and this teaching about the second coming and all that we've been studying. And I pray, God, that your spirit might bear witness with our spirits to teach us, to instruct us in the way that you'd have us to go. And, Father, to live in expectation of the return of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we get...